Welcome to episode 272 of the Actual Astronomy Podcast. Today we're talking amateur telescope making. I'm Chris and joining me is Shane. We're amateur astronomers who love looking up at the night sky. And this podcast is for anybody else who likes going out under the stars. And joining us today is Tom. He's a listener and an amateur telescope maker. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Tom. We, we really appreciate you joining us. And uh, it's been great chatting with you so far. And we're excited to uh, carry on the conversation in a recorded format. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to it. Excellent. So maybe what we'll do is we'll just start really quick. Uh, just get you to tell us and, and our listeners uh, a little bit about um, your journey as an amateur astronomer and uh, what your interests in astronomy are in particular. Sure. Um, so uh, I've been an astronomer um, off and on since high school. Um, and uh, my original um, amateur telescope making or ATM, um, you know, as, as we kind of short, short form it, um, ATM journey started back then um, building uh, an eight inch telescope an eight inch ultimately turned out to be a Dobsonian, which we can talk about a little bit later. Um, and, uh, but then, you know, I mean, life gets in the way, university, family, and all of that stuff. And so actually, I put down astronomy for uh, about two decades. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then I got back into it. Um, when, uh, when I kind of dusted off that eight inch, and uh, my wife's family bought a cottage in Muskoka, and okay. um, and that's really really close to a one of the first dark sky preserves in Canada, um, yeah. the Torrance Barrens, and up, in, up near Gravenhurst, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And the skies yeah. are like freakishly dark. It was so incredible, and uh, so I you know I dusted off the eight inch and uh, and started observing again and kind of got the bug, and um, and then once I got the bug, I thought, oh, you know, one thing I've always wanted was a was a much larger telescope, and so that's when I kind of got the ATM bug and uh, and started down a path of of building a much larger telescope. Cool. So, and then you know, and that was that was actually a a pretty intensive job. I you know I I bit off way more than I could chew, <laughs> but you know, but I had I had a great mentor. And, um, you know, and it really kind of stretched my skills, but I learned, I learned an awful lot and, uh, and I've ended up with a telescope that I'm, I'm really proud of. It's awesome. Excellent. Yeah. Um, Tom, you know, one thing Chris and I have not really talked much about on the podcast is amateur telescope making. <laughs> and I think it's because neither one of us have, pro I don't know about you, Chris, but I've never really given it a lot of thought. Um, so because this is a new topic for probably a lot of our listeners, um, could you maybe just give a little bit of a definition of that, Tom? Like, what do we mean when we're talking about amateur telescope making? Sure. Well, uh, I mean, ATM is, is basically just literally that instead of buying a commercial telescope, uh, you, you make some or all of it. And really, there are, there are two, uh, two kind of major camps. Um, there's, the, there's the ATM crowd that um, assembles telescopes. So they'll buy optics, for example, um, you know, they'll buy mirrors or lenses, you know, if they're making a refractor, and, um, and they'll put together all of the bits and pieces to make a fully functional telescope. And uh, so that that's on the one side. And then on the other side are the really hardcore ATMers that make some or all of their optics. Um, in addition to all of the all of the stuff, you know, to, to put the telescope together. Um, my first telescope was um, in Camp One. Um, so I had purchased all of the all of the optics um, separately. Um, you know, so like the primary mirror. Um, so and, and sorry, and I should say that, you know, that typically, you know, when when people are making telescopes, they tend to be Newtonian scopes because from an optic standpoint, it's the it's the simplest. Um, you know, so my eight inch uh, was, you know, I purchased the, you know, the, the the primary from a company down in the States. I, actually, all of my stuff was sourced from the States at that time. And, um, and you know, so I got all of the parts together and then and then I assembled the tube and the mount and, and all of that stuff and, you know, and laid out the optics so that so that it all kind of worked. 
Um, but the, my more recent telescope and, and what a, a smaller number of ATMs do is actually build their own optics as well. And this involves actually grinding mirrors or grinding lenses. Typically it's mirrors. Um, I don't know too many people that are actually grinding their own, um, lenses for refractors, but, um, you know, but you'll be grinding your own mirror and polishing it and figuring it and, um, you know, making it uh, optical ready, you know, for, for a telescope. So th those are the two kind of major camps. And, you know, as I say, my second telescope, the, um, my most recent one is, is in camp two, where I actually created the optics as well. Wow. That's pretty cool. Um, you know, I know we're going to get into a whole bunch of layers here, but is there, do you need special tools to do this or, or, you know, I guess I'm, if I was to, I'm intrigued by this. So if I was to go down this path, I'm, I'm curious about, uh, if I have, you know, uh, you know, a side grinder in my garage. Is that all I need? I'm, yeah, I'm pretty no. sure that's not it, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the techniques are surprisingly, um, crude and, you know, and they've been techniques that have been used for like a couple of centuries. So it's, um, it's amazing how precise an optical instrument you can make just by using your hands and grit, you know, mm. is essentially it. You know, and then the basic principle is, you know, if we're, if we're talking about mirrors, you know, if you rub two pieces of glass together with some grit in between them, naturally what will happen is that one of them will become convex and the other will become concave. And the, the basic idea in making a telescope mirror is that you just keep doing that until you get the shape that you want. Um, and then you use finer and finer grits to get it as smooth as possible. And then ultimately you go to the next step of actually polishing it, which is just still the same process again, but just with slightly different materials. And, and then once you've got it polished and you have a spherical mirror, then the last step is to take that sphere and do kind of selective polishing to make it into a parabola. And, um, and so, you know, as I say, the, the technique is relatively crude. Um, and then, um, and then it comes down to how do you actually test for the parabola? Um, and there are a couple of techniques that have been around for a century or more, and, uh, and they work perfectly well. Some people are doing some newer things using laser interferometry, interferometry <laughs> to, uh, to try and, um, you know, kind of speed up the process or get more accurate measurements of their, of their mirror surface. But, um, but there's very simple optical tests that you can do um, that, uh, that do an amazingly great job of indicating, you know, that your mirror is done. And, um, so it's, it's not hard, but depending on the type of mirror that you, that you tackle, you know, you can make it harder for yourself. And, and certainly my, my latest one, you know, was tackling something that was very, very aggressive and very challenging, but I had great mentors and, uh, and I'm kind of proof positive that someone who hasn't actually ground a mirror, before, um, you know, can actually do something really advanced and innovative. Yeah, that's nice. really, that's really incredible. What, what makes, uh, like, so you mentioned your latest project is a little more challenging. Um, what amps up the difficulty? Uh, what makes it challenging? Right. So uh, a couple of things. So when, you know, when you're making a telescope, you kind of, uh, you, you need to, you need to figure out why you're making your telescope. And, you know, and, and what you hope to get out of it, what's your, what are your use cases, you know, in particular, um, how do you, how do you plan to use it? And, and, you know, that sort of thing, because that'll affect things like how big a telescope you want to make and what kind of a design and, you know, and how portable it has to be. So all of those kinds of things. Um, and then, um, and then once you sort of decide on that, um, you know, things that can really make it more challenging are aperture. So uh, a, you know, an eight inch telescope or a six inch telescope, which is, you know, often what um, ATMs will tackle first when they, when they try and make their own mirror um, is going to be simpler than um, a 16 inch or a 20 inch or even, even larger. So aperture um, makes a big, big difference. The other thing that makes a big, big difference is the um, focal ratio of your telescope. So, you know, this, this is the, you know, you'll often see, you know, that, that this mirror is an eight inch F7, you know, which basically just says that the focal length of the mirror 
um, is seven times the diameter. So for an eight inch telescope, an F7 will be a 56 inch telescope. And so that gives you kind of an idea dimensionally of how big your telescope is going to be if you had an eight inch F7 mirror in it. So um, one of the things that really makes teles uh, mirror making challenging is to um, go down in the focal ratio. So to, to make your scopes faster and faster. And so an F7 is relatively easy to make, whereas an F3 is relatively hard to make. Um, and, and just for, 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 for perspective, um, you know, Artemis, which is my, my latest telescope, um, it's a 14 inch mirror. And it's an F 2.6. Wow. So, um, and, you know, and if, and if we look at my use cases for why I decided to do that, my primary use case was I wanted a big aperture telescope, but I also didn't want to have a telescope that was going to need a ladder to climb up to the eyepiece or, a, um, or like a truck to haul it around in, mm -hmm. you know, so I was strongly motivated to try and get as much aperture into as small uh, a compact size as possible. And so that that decision right there was, you know, what really, really amped up the the difficulty is is making um, making an, an F 2.6 or anything, you know, F3 or faster is, is a really, really challenging thing to do. So all of the basic stuff, like the grinding, you know, of the initial shape and, and the polishing and whatnot, that's that's just um table stakes and and it's not any more difficult um to you know to to uh, grind and polish you know an f3 mirror as opposed to an f7 mirror and and really all that matters there is is your aperture um you know the more area you have to work on the longer it takes and that that kind of stands to reason but you know where the real challenge is um, you know for these faster mirrors is um, is how to do the figuring so how to convert your spherical mirror, which is what you get out of the polishing step into the parabola that you need. And the faster it is, the basically the deeper the curve on your on your mirror and and the more um, the more finesse you need to apply to get the the sphere to convert into a parabola. So that that's where you know the bulk of the work is. Interesting. So, yeah. And, and then, and then the other thing that you know that makes mine particularly challenging as well is, in addition to it being a fast mirror, it's also what's called a thin meniscus mirror. And so, ordinarily, when people are making mirrors, they start with a slab of glass and and they um, and they carve out the shape, you know, for for the mirror, and um, and 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 then they go. Um, now, the the pro the challenge there is that. Um, when you get into these faster and faster mirrors, the the curve in the glass gets deeper and deeper. And so um, what happens at that point is depending on how thick your original slab of glass was, you know, the the thickness of the glass down at the deepest part is going to be substantially thinner than the thickness of the glass at the um, at the edges. And that could potentially make your glass, um, you know, mechanically um, unstable. Um, but at, at a minimum, it will affect how the glass cools because obviously more glass cools slower than um, than less glass. And so your cooling is going to be all messed up. And, and so um, it, it becomes more of a challenge to create um, these fast mirrors um, using thick slabs of glass. So, um, you know, what I and a number of people have, have been working on are how to make thin meniscus mirrors, which are essentially shaped like contact lenses. So the mirror is uniformly thick throughout its entire um, diameter and, and it's curved on the front and the back. And the way we do this is we start by taking a, a piece of glass and slumping it in a kiln. So that gives us the initial contact lens shape. And then we take it from there and, and, you know, and work the, the front surface of the mirror to get, you know, the, the, the smooth surface and the parabola and whatnot. But basically the mirror is uniformly thick, or in this case, uniformly thin throughout. And what that gets us is the ability to create larger apertures using far less glass because um, you know, if you think about it, if you if you take a piece of paper and you kind of try and stand it on its edge, it it just kind of flops all over the place. You know, whereas if you take that piece of paper and you fold and you kind of rotate it into or uh, fold it into a cone, it's much stiffer. Um, you know, in the in the dimension, you know, along the along the length of the cone. 
And the principle is similar to the meniscus, where because the mirror is curved, um, it's kind of it supports itself a little bit more, and that allows you to use less glass um, and still get a relatively stiff mirror. And so that, that's what we've been doing is kind of pushing the envelope in terms of how thin a piece of glass we can shape into a relatively large mirror. And so my 14 inch um, is uh, five eighths of an inch thick throughout. Um, but I know people that have um, made 30 inch mirrors that are also five eighths of an inch thick. And there, you know, the mirrors do tend to be a little bit floppier. And so you need to do a little bit more engineering in terms of the mirror mount. Um, you know, when you're actually using it in the telescope. Um, but that that kind of shows you the, the kind of um, the kind of things that are possible if you if you kind of want to take some risks. Wow. That's I'm fascinating. Really... Chris, you need to build a kiln in your garage so we can do this. <laughs> I'm yeah, trying to get yeah. an observatory built, folks. That's yeah. that's my focus. I got a question. I'm really surprised uh, by one thing here, uh, Tom, and that's that you went from from buying off the shelf components um, which to me seems like a realistic project for, for many folks because um, you can buy some awesome mirrors either from other amateurs, you see them for sale, or from uh, professional mirror makers. But you went from, from just putting a scope together with off-the-shelf components to actually grinding your own, uh, really what's considered to be quite an ultra-fast telescope uh, below F3. And I'm just curious, like how long did it take you to actually grind uh, that mirror, like sort of from start uh, to finish and sort of in retrospect, do you wish maybe you had ground a slower mirror first, or I'm just really curious on that process. Cause I haven't met too many people that went right from, uh, you know, thinking about grinding a mirror to grinding one down below F3. That seems very extreme. <laughs> yeah. Well, so yeah, a couple of things there. Um, I mean, so first of all, you know, there's, there's, a there's the maker in me, right. To, to actually want to make something as opposed to just buying something commercially. So I did want to, to try my hand at this. Um, but then, you know, but then the other thing is, you know, I wanted a relatively large, larger aperture, you know, and, and, you know, obviously, you know, the, the, the bigger the aperture um, the more expensive, you know, buying a commercial mirror is going to be. So, you know, I wanted, I wanted to save some money. Um, and, you know, and in practice, you know, if you're making, um, if you're making a telescope and you want to grind your optics, you're not going to end up saving that much money uh, in th this day and age, because, you know, there are a lot of, um, you know, a lot of bigger Dobsonian scopes that you can get relatively inexpensively. So, you know, so if all you want is aperture and you don't have the maker bug, then maybe the right thing to do is to buy, you know, a commercial scope. But so one of the reasons I, I chose to go the route that I did was because I, I was, uh, you know, as an engineer, it, it, I was I was kind of really intrigued by trying my hand at making one of these things. Um, and then and then, of course, you know, there there were those use cases where, you know, I wanted something relatively portable. And so, you know, I'm not not going to be able to find, you know, a 14 inch F3 mirror, you know, or, you know, something that will give me the form factor that I wanted in my in my um, end result. Also, unfortunately, in quotation marks, um, you know, as I was kind of researching, you know, what my options were, I came across the site of a master optician called Mel Bartels. And th this guy's incredible. I mean, he's been making telescopes for like 40 years. And uh, he is just a master of his craft. And I saw one of his um, telescopes called the Zip Dob. Um, that was a 13 inch F 2.8 or 2.9, something like that. And I looked at it and go, man, I want this scope because not only, you know, did it meet my kind of sweet spot of form factor, but the cool thing was that it also folded up, which was even cooler. And, you know, and so the, the, the thing just kind of folded up like a clamshell and, you know, and that made it highly portable. And so, uh, you know, I, I reached out to Mel and I said, hey, um, I love this telescope. You want to sell it? And, and he said, no. Um, but he also offered to help me make something like that and, uh, and extremely generous with his time. He's an awesome mentor. And, um, and so he's kind of really helped me on that journey. So that, that helped, um, make me want to bite off, you know, this type of a project. And, um, 
uh, there was one other aspect to this. Oh, but but then in you know in in terms of things that I I wish maybe I hadn't done. I hadn't intended to go f two point six to be honest. I I had intended to go around two point eight, um, but um, but when it came out of the kiln, it came out a little bit faster than than I was expecting, and uh, rather than kind of go back to square one. And uh, and you know and redo the the form that that the glass sits on inside of the kiln. I decided to just you know try it because I thought naively I thought yeah two point eight two point six what's the difference you know so um, so that that kind of is something that I wish I hadn't done and and frankly if I were to make another one um, you know I would probably go a little bit slower um, still um, f three or faster you know maybe two point eight. Um, but but not not quite so low as two point six because ultimately um, ultimately I couldn't make it folding because the two point six resulted in um, in a form factor where the engineering complexity added by folding um, you know folding the whole telescope assembly could far outweighed the benefits of of saving saving volume and saving space so I ended up not being able to fold it. Um, but more importantly, um, you know, for these really fast scopes, collimation becomes a really, really important thing. Um, it is, it, it's important, it's critically important to have your scope well collimated. Otherwise, you don't get the really tight focus of stars. You don't get the, um, um, the ability to split really close doubles. So uh, collimation is, is something that I battle a bunch. And, um, yeah, so you know that's something that that I wish I, I hadn't gone quite so fast. So maybe um, I'll just hop in there with with another question, which is uh, maybe can you just explain what collimation is to the listeners and and for those that do know, I, I think uh, those that, those of us who have tried to optically align our telescopes at f six, maybe uh, I figure like f two point six must be very difficult. So how so? What is col- culmination and collimation, and how do you optically align? Uh, such a fast telescope. Yeah, well, so collimation is optically aligning all of the bits. So, um, you know, everything from making sure that your focuser is square to your optical axis, um, uh, then you know, making sure that your um, that your diagonal is um, is aligned so that it's hitting the center of your mirror, and then your and then your mirror. Is aligned so that it reflects back um, straight up the um, optical axis and back up into the eyepiece. So it's essentially, you know, create ensuring that your light path is exactly um, perpendicular and and you know straight up and down. You know, so it, it's 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 just that. And you know, on, on an F seven, for example, you know, it's it's a relatively straightforward thing. I mean, you can look down your focuser tube and you can kind of eyeball whether your um, your secondary is rotated um, one way or the other by, you know, whether or not you see your secondary as being a circle or an ellipse. Um, and then you can also then look at the reflection of the secondary in your primary and make sure that that's all centered and then you can also see your eyeball as a reflection and you can make sure that your eyeball is in the middle. So in an F7, it's a relatively straightforward thing to do. Um, but in, in something like an F3 or faster, um, typically what we use is what's called the laser collimator, you know, which is essentially just a laser that fits into your, um, uh, your um, eyepiece, your focuser tube. And it shoots the laser down onto your secondary, and then the secondary reflects it to your primary. The primary reflects it back, and then back up to you know your eyepiece. And um, and what you do is you you look for your dots, you know your laser dots, and make sure that they are hitting exactly where they need to be. And you know, and one of the key things is hitting the center of your primary exactly because if it's off by just a little bit and then you kind of tilt your mirror a little bit, then you end up having a focal plane that's on an angle. So when you're trying to focus with your eyepiece, your focal plane isn't now square to, you know, to the eyepiece. And so as a result, you might get it perfectly in focus in one particular place, but then off of that place, you know, uh, on either side of, um, you know, the field of view, it's going to be out of focus. And that, that just really 
kind of messes up your ability to resolve really fine detail. So you need to make sure that all of these things are precisely lined up. And, and you know, as I say, lasers, lasers are the best way to do that. Um, although Mel Bartels will argue that the best way to collimate your telescope is to build it in, in the first place. So he does, you know, painstakingly precise um, uh, um, building of his optical tube assembly, you know, so that all of the all of the bits are as square as possible. So that when you plop the mirror in, um, it's a it's a much easier. He finds it a much um, easier process to collimate because mm. the bulk of it has already been built in. So I my woodworking skills during this project have uh, have grown, <laughs> but you know when I was doing it, um, I you know there was there were things that I couldn't do because I, I didn't have the right tools or whatever. You know, so I just just did the best I could. So as a result, collimation for me is a little bit more challenging. Um, yeah, so that, that's, that's what collimation is. And, and, you know, because of the faster, um, the faster scopes, um, it just becomes a much more important thing to do. Yeah, for sure. When do I, correctly. What, yeah, yeah. It, uh, it is a bit of a process and I found also that a laser collimator really made the process a lot quicker, simpler, yep. uh, when I had my F5 12 inch. Um, another thing that I read about back then was, um, a Barlow collimation, uh, process. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you essentially get like an aperture mask that screws into the bottom of the Barlow with a very small pinpoint hole in the middle. And, um, what I was always amazed at, like I'd do an initial collimation just with the laser collimator and thought I would have it kind of bang on. And then when I introduced the Barlow with that little aperture mask, if you would call it that. I was always surprised, like there is still like a, another, like finer adjustment needed to get it just bang on. And it, yeah. it seemed to accurize the collimation a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely adding a Barlow attachment to your laser collimator is, is, uh, is a plus one. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, um, and, and then ultimately though, you know, the, the final arbiter of how well your scope is collimated is the star test, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we use, and we use a star test to do the final, um, sign off, if you will, of, of, you know, your mirror when you're making it, um, you know, your bench tests, um, whether it's a Foucault test or a, um, you know, a Ronke test, you know, they, they give you a really good estimation of how good your scope is, um, or your mirror is, but ultimately, um, it's the star test that determines how well your mirror will perform. And, and then how well your your scope is collimated. So, and the star test for those that don't know is, you know, you pick a sort of a medium bright star like Polaris works really well. Um, and, uh, and, you know, you center it in your field. And then what you do is you take your focuser and you focus a little bit out and a little bit in. And, to, uh, and you do this at, at, at relatively high power, like 200X or more if you can. And what that gives you is, when you focus out and in at relatively high power, you'll see a bunch of concentric rings around the star, and those are diffraction rings. And um, and when you're perfectly collimated and and you have perfect optics, um, you know the rings will be concentric. And when you focus out and focus in, um, the rings will kind of break out, and and you'll see you know the, um you'll see the shadow of your secondary start to appear and that shadow will appear at at rel at roughly the same distance both in and out as you're focusing in and focusing out so you want to look for the for the con um uh, for the concentric rings and um and and the secondary breakout and what happens is if your optics are imperfect or if you're not collimated then as you focus in and focus out the rings won't be concentric your your star shape will become an oval um or sorry uh, yeah an, an oval or an ellipse and you know and and so that's your kind of signal that you want to you know just very very um uh, slightly adjust your primary um orientation. So even though your laser might have said that you, that you're all squared up, um you know, you're, you you do the fine tuning on on the adjustment screws on your on your primary to basically get these uh, rings to be concentric and um and circular. And and that that fine tuning, you know, you can only do on a star test. You can't really eyeball it with your laser. Yeah. And, and great recommendation to use Polaris, uh, you know, so you don't have to track, exactly. you know, especially with yeah. the big Newtonian. Exactly. Yeah. 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 For sure. I, yeah. I have to apologize. I, 
I, I couldn't find the the uh, image of your telescope. I've put it up here now, Tom, because... Well, um, this one's not mine, though. This oh, one that's is not, not yours. That, no. Is that Mel's? Okay. That's Mel's, yeah, yeah. Okay. But if you, uh, um, you know, if you go to um, perhaps keep scrolling, um, the equatorial platform might have a picture of it. Yeah, so if you go to that one. My apologies, I should have. I should have uh, made sure. I I thought I had a photo, and then I went looking for it here today, and I couldn't locate it. Um, but yeah, here are your parts and everything are down. Yeah, here. so this is for the so. Uh, oh crap! So it's not there. Um, I mean, I can I can send you a, a picture. Obviously, okay, and we can yeah, put it I in just, the show just notes. Just kind of right? wanted to share it. I wonder if maybe we could get a shot of it to share with people. So yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm for thinking sure. it looks a lot like the the Mel Bar telescope then. Yeah. It do, it does look uh, quite quite a lot like it. Um, obviously, he influenced my design heavily, and he helped me a lot. Um, you, you know, and and like I I don't want to sound like I'm an expert in this, you know, because I've gone through the process and and I am helping other people. Um, but there's you know, Mel has forgotten more than I know, you know, and so uh, um, you know, I, I I I'm just I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, you know, in in many cases, but. Um, um, it, you know, but, you know, uh, one of the other interesting things about, about ATM is that it's not just about the optics, right? So once I got Artemis built and working and, oh, and, and I completely forgot about the how long question, which is an interesting question, but, but just, but let me, let me just complete this thought it is, you know, once I got Artemis working, um, you know, one of the things that became immediately obvious to me is that, um, um, I needed tracking, um, you know, because while it's it's great to be able to just, you know, kind of quickly look at something and, and kind of hand track, I did want to, and, and, and this is this is more a function of the fact that everyone who looks at, at the telescope, you know, says, oh, wow, what is it? Because it looks really, really distinctive, you know, and then they look through it. And so it becomes like a really, really um, great outreach magnet. And, um, you know, we, we just did an outreach thing at, at the University of Toronto a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, and people were like lined up behind the telescope wanting to look through it. And so, you know, for, for me to do outreach, you know, I think that one of the, one of the things that I want to do is, uh, is kind of dabble in electronically assisted astronomy. So basically having a digital eyepiece and then allowing that to somehow project onto a phone or an iPad or something like that to allow more people to see what the scope is pointing at in relatively real time. But to do Which, that, you absolutely need to have tracking. So one of the things yeah. that I'm adding is, is, you know, an equatorial platform to allow the telescope to track for limited periods of time. Yeah. And, and I think if I, if I recall correctly, I don't know that much about the, the uh, electronically assisted astronomy, but I think it works quite well with these sort of faster telescopes from, from what I've heard. For sure. Yeah. Because, you know, that there's a lot of, a lot of light being gathered. And so, you know, your, your frame rate can be pretty, pretty fast. Um, I was experimenting with pictures of Jupiter a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, you know, yeah, you of, sent us one of those that looked fantastic. Yeah. And, and, and if, and I don't know if you look at the details, but, but that image was one frame that was, um, sorry, that was a stack, but I was stacking images that were 500 microseconds long. You know, and and so, um, you know, kind of riffing on what you guys were talking about in terms of, you know, getting good, um, good views of Jupiter and how you need to look at it for hours, you know, to get those mm -hmm. glimpses, right? And, you know, because, because seeing so dramatically affects, you know, what, you know, what you actually end up seeing, um, you know, the, the ability to take really, really fast frame rates means that you can kind of um, average out the you know the seeing effects much more readily and you know and, and that helps by having you know more aperture more light so that you can take these faster frame rates and hopefully you know get past the atmospheric turbulence and then and then stack the images and i was i was kind of happy with the way that one turned out it was not too bad um one of the <laughs> one of the funny things about my um, this, this project, you know, going back to a question you had asked about how long is, um, the, the initial mirror, um, took quite a long time. It took about 18 months to do and that, but that included, 
um, you know, figuring out how to use the kiln because I, I got a kiln off of Craigslist or Kijiji. I can't remember which one it was. Um, so I just got a, you know, a normal dumb ceramic kiln and, and then figuring out how to basically computerize that because when you're, when you're doing the kiln work, you need to have really, really precise temperature control over an extended period of time, like 48 hours. And um, because you can't, you need to very gradually um, slump the glass and you can't shock it by, you know, heating it up too quickly. Or more importantly, when you cool it down, you need to cool it down super gradually. Otherwise you bake in a bunch of strain that could end up, um, you know, kind of releasing as you're working the mirror and the mirror smashes. Um, so anyhow, so, you know, being able to computerize the kiln, you know, was it was a bit of a project. And then once I got that, um, you know, figuring out how to do the slumping mold, so that, um, you know, you can slump the glass and, and yeah, my website's got some details on how to do all that. And, uh, so there was that, and then actually slumping the, the glass and, uh, and then working the glass and whatnot. Uh, so eventually I got to the point where it was almost done and that was roughly 18 months from when I started, you know, because in the meantime, you know, I've got a job and I got kids who play hockey and, you know, like those, <laughs> it, it, you know, it's tough to find all of the time to do yeah. all of this stuff. And um, so 18 months goes by and, and I'm almost ready. And I was doing some star testing up the cottage and, um, um, and I had a test rig and um, the mirror fell out of the test rig and landed oh, on the ground no. and <laughs> broke, broke into three pieces. Oh, oh. And, oh, and I'm no. looking at that. I imagine your heart just were broken uh, in three pieces. Of that. Well, you know, I looked, I looked at it and I go, are you kidding me? Oh, you know, and, yeah. and at that point I was, I was like deeply into meditation. And so I was, I was amazed at how um, equanimous I was, you know, looking at this broken mirror after 18 months, I was surprised I didn't just pick up the glass and huck it into the forest. <laughs> and so I, I collected the pieces and I told my wife, Hey, guess what happened? And, um, so it, and it took about a month for me to decide whether I was going to do this again. And, uh, so what I ended up doing though, was, um, using, um, um, windshield repair glue to basically glue the, the bits back together again. Obviously I couldn't use the mirror as is, mm -hmm, um, yeah. but I was able to glue the bits back together again and then create a new kiln form from that, that would then go into the kiln to allow me to slump version two of the mirror. And, and the cool, wow. but the really cool thing, you know, was that that 18 months compressed down to about five months for the second go round. So, you know, that happened the mirror broke in like August in September, I decided to redo. And by January, I was star testing again. So, wow. you know, obviously I learned an awful lot, you know, yeah. in, in version one. And yeah. uh, so I was able to really accelerate getting back to uh, getting back to the point where I could star test. Um, and obviously I was start testing much more carefully with a better test rig. And, uh, and then we got to where we are. And then, um, uh, you know, the scope was working really well. And um, you'll see some pictures on the website and, you know, what you're currently showing. Um, you know, the scope worked really well and uh, it had its first public uh, viewing at Starfest, um, you know, which is the big star party in Ontario in August. And uh, that was, that was pre COVID. And, um, and, you know, people were really, really impressed with, you know, how well it was working. And, and generally, I was really happy with it, too. The one thing that bugged me, though, was that at really high powers, the images were soft. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I don't know whether it was because I was expecting more, um, you know, or, you know, especially comparing it to like a refractor image or something, you know, but it just, yeah, there's a picture of the mirror broken. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. memories. Yeah. But, um, uh, you know, the, the images, the high powered images were a little bit soft and I was still learning the collimation thing. And, um, but, you know, but when, when you look at the, the, the test images, you know, the ronky images for, for that mirror, the, the mi surface of the mirror was pretty rough. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, we all kind of concluded that maybe the softness was as a result of, you know, the surface being a little bit rougher than it should be. So actually, um, during COVID, I decided to refigure the mirror, which basically means, you know, taking um taking it back to a sphere 
and then and then reparabolizing it, you know, which which is uh, a many 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 hour process, um, you know, like tens of hours, and um, but the end result was a much much smoother figure. And so now it's actually, I'm really, really happy with how well it works. And then when it's properly collimated, um, you know, I get, I get much better, um, much better results. So I'm, I, I don't think I'm going to mess with the mirror again. Um, with the one exception of silvering, which is a whole other topic. Yeah. I've um, seen Peter talk about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, as you get, as your mirrors get bigger and bigger, um, so let's let, take a step back. Um, back in the day, like in the 30s or earlier, um, you know, silver was the was the the thing of choice, the the coating of choice for your for your optical mirrors. And um, the uh, it's a relatively simple chemical process to to deposit silver onto onto a mirror surface, and so that's that's typically what was done. Um, but then, um, you know, then they discovered this process of um, vacuum depositing aluminum onto mirror surfaces, and that became the way that that mirrors typically were were made reflective. And um, you know, and and certainly any commercial telescope that you'll buy, um, uh, you know, commercial amateur telescope, you know, that you'll buy, they'll they'll be alumnized mirrors, you know, that will also have special coatings, you know, to kind of amp up their reflectivity. And one of the reasons why they went away from silver is because silver tarnishes. And so, you know, if you silver your mirror, you're basically going to be re-silvering your mirror every, um, I mean, it depends on where you're, you know, where you're using it and how often it's exposed to the atmosphere, you know, but you could be re-silvering after six months or you could be re-silvering after a year, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a relatively immediate process. And so, um, but the problem with alumnizing is that it's not cheap. And, and as ATMs make bigger and bigger aperture mirrors, um, what, you know, which is one of the motivations for doing this is, is, you know, you, you want a, as big an aperture as you can possibly get away with, um, you know, to, to have that alumnized, you know, costs thousands of dollars. And, and especially if you've made your mirror. So imagine you spent, you know, like, um, a year making a 25 inch mirror. Are you going to want to risk shipping that to an mm -hmm. alumnizing shop to get it alumnized and, and then have it shipped back, you know, and, and, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a kind of a, a, a dice roll unless you can, you know, hand deliver it. And so we've been experimenting with silvering and, you know, and you mentioned Peter, who's, you know, one of the guys that, you know, that I work with on this, um, you know, we've been experimenting with doing silvering at home and kind of rediscovering this process. And, um, and it's working surprisingly well. And, mm. uh, and so, you know, once you have the, the chemicals um, to actually silver a mirror costs like 10 bucks, you know, it's wow. not, not expensive. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, and so it, it makes it totally doable to, um, you know, to resilver your mirror, you know, every season. You know, you just strip off the old silver and, and re-silver it. And and in addition, though, you know, some of the some of the people that are kind of working on this, you know, we've found some materials that we can spray onto the silver to um to slow down the tarnishing. Mm. And so it's entirely possible now to silver your mirror and not have to re-silver it for 18 months. Wow. You know, which which makes it totally fine. Even if you had to do it once yeah. a season, you know, yeah. or once a year, I think that that would be totally fine. And you know, and and I've gotten really fast at silvering now, so I can silver a mirror in like a half an hour, you know. And that includes that wow. includes stripping off, you know, the old silver, it, which is really cool chemistry. <laughs> like it just disappears. <laughs> Um, and, uh, stripping it off and cleaning your mirror and, and putting on a new silver coating. And I can do it, you know, in 30 minutes, you know, that that's going really fast, you know, but easily, you know, under an hour, you know, so um, I, I think that that's like a totally doable project. So that's hmm. interesting. Cause I think it was Herschel that would always have like two mirrors and then he'd have uh, one that was in the scope and then one they'd be resilvering or working on. And then when the other one tarnished out, they just swap it out. And it was just like a forever cycle. But um, yeah, it's kind of interesting to hear that, that you folks have been able to, to distill this down to, uh, to a really quick process. That yeah. is super yeah. cool. And I've seen Peter's video on doing it. He's got a video on YouTube, I think, yeah. somewhere yeah. doing it. But don't you have to wear like a COVID hazmat suit or something like that when you're 
Well, you know, it depends on who you talk to, I guess. <laughs> uh, te- technically, maybe technically, maybe you should. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, I do not. So um, I, I'm, yeah, so I do not. But, um, I, you know, that's, that's my choice. You know, and, and Peter's video, um, you know, he uses uh, basically hand sprayers, you know, and he's just like, spray, 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 spray you know, and that, that's like, it's good for your your wrist strength and whatnot. Yeah. Um, you know, a, a number of us use a commercial um, a commercial product uh, from Angel Gilding, um, which is basically a, a a place that we found that um, is for doing decorative mirrors. And oh, okay. so they have they've got a silvering kit that includes pump sprayers and and all of the chemistry and whatnot. So the initial outlay is you know like a couple hundred bucks. Um, you know, for all of the gear. Um, if you wanted, you know, it all as, as one big kit and then, and then once you, you, but the actual consumption of the chemistry, you know, it's like, you know, like 10, 20 bucks of, of chemicals, you know, each time you use silver. So it's not a big deal. Um, but you know, now, now that, now that we know, you know, everything that's in the angel gilding kit, I mean, there's nothing preventing you from using, you know, like a couple of, um, um, you know, garden weed sprayer, you know, pump up weed sprayer things, yeah. um, you know, to, to have your, your chemicals in and, and then, and then just kind of spray it as opposed to doing like hand spraying, you know, mm-hmm. which seemed very labor intensive, but he got, he's been getting great results with that too. Cool. And so you're, you're, you're now doing that process instead of, uh, uh, aluminizing. Yeah, 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 yeah. for sure. Uh, cool. So one of the things that, uh, you know, I lived in Ontario for a while, I actually used to observe with, uh, with Peter, we were sort of talking offline uh, about that. And uh, one of the things that always struck me the most about um, these amateur telescope made mirrors um, that maybe we should touch on a little bit is just how much better the quality control is um, with a telescope that somebody has made with their own hands. And uh, I just wonder if maybe you want to talk about uh, that maybe being an attraction to to actually uh, making this a worthwhile uh, process for people to go through. Because the results, um, when you look through a telescope, somebody has has designed the telescope tube to optimize tube currents right down to the, you know, the, the specs on the mirror to make sure that it's as optically um, perfect as, as that person can make. Uh, the results are just uh, astounding. And I just wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit about uh, that being a motivation and and maybe what you've seen and, and what you would like to see with your telescope. Yeah. Um, so uh, I don't know that that would have been one of my motivations specifically, but I, but I think, you know, kind of getting back to the use case question, you know, building your own allows you to build your own you know, so that it's to your specifications, it's, it's for your use case or whatever, you know, and, and, and I had mentioned, you know, that, that one of the things that, um, you know, that, that drives ATMs is bigger and bigger apertures, you know, it, it, and, and you get to the point where it, it just becomes commercially unfeasible, um, in, infeasible, um, to, um, you know, to buy something, you know, like you're never going to buy a 30 inch telescope and yet people are making 30 inch telescopes, you know, big, huge light buckets. And so, um, uh, but, you know, but for sure, you know, all of the, all of the bits and pieces that go into it, you know, are lovingly made and, and, um, you know, to exacting standards, it potentially, you know, I mean, it, it depends on the maker, um, you know, it's like some people are super happy with just like slapping something together and just getting a big aperture, but relatively crude results. I mean, you know, the, when we never actually talked about John Dobson, you know, who really, we need was, to do a whole show, oh gosh, we yeah, do, yeah, yeah, we yeah. do. Yeah. <laughs> but just, just like the, you know, the 30 second elevator pitch. I mean, John Dobson was a huge, um, catalyst to this whole ATM movement. Um, because he was, uh, he was a guy who, um, uh, from California, you know, who was building these bigger and bigger telescopes and just setting them up on sidewalks in California. Um, but he would, he would do them in the crudest possible way. And, um, and, you know, and his thinking was that it doesn't have to be like this pristine, you know, like seeing the guys, you know, assembling James Webb with face masks and, you know, like all of this, you know, clean room stuff. It just doesn't have to be that way. You know, you can make a relatively crude large mirror and put it into a crude cardboard tube, 
using a secondary that's supported with shingles, you know, and, and a cardboard um, mirror cell and, and it will just work, you know, and, and it allows you to, you know, focus on just getting bigger and bigger apertures and not worry about all of the other stuff. You know, so so that's the complete antithesis to what you're talking about is, you know, that it doesn't have to be magic. It doesn't have to be because it's it's simple optics, you know, that were discovered like hundreds of years ago. I mean, it's called a Newtonian telescope because, you know, Newton did it. Right. And and so it's just not rocket science. And and while you can certainly engineer the heck out of these things. Um, you know, to, to have like cooling fans and, and whatnot to control the boundary layer on the mirror surface so that it reduces, you know, any sort of atmospheric effects and equalizes the temperature on the front and back of your mirror. Like all of those things you can absolutely do more power to you if you want to. But on the flip side, you don't have to. And so it, it, it comes down to, you know, what the maker wants. And, you know, and if the maker wants a huge light bucket and doesn't want to, you know, go through the expense of all of the frills and whatnot, you can absolutely create a huge light bucket and see stuff that you can't possibly see with an eight inch, um, eight inch, you know, reflector that, that you buy from, uh, you know, buy it, your favorite telescope shop. So um, yeah, it, sure. it really just depends on what your motivations are. Yeah. Um, Tom, if, if somebody is interested in, uh, going down this ATM path, do you have any resources, books, websites, YouTubes that you recommend as, uh, you know, something or a place to go if somebody wants more information, or even if you have some of your own websites or YouTubes that you want to promote? Um, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I, I do have a website, um, astronomy.tomotbos.ca, which has got some stuff and, and, but I, I just, you know, I, I do, I do ultimately want to document more of what I've done, but it's just, it's just so hard to find the time to kind of keep yeah. up to date. So you'll find a number of things related to my project on there, but it, it's still not hundred percent complete. So that is a resource, but it's not, not necessarily a great resource. I would say the best resource is cloudy nights, okay. um, which you guys mention all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, but there are lots of parts to cloudy nights and, you know, and there's observational stuff, there's astrophotography stuff and, um, and, but there's a huge section on cloudy nights that's just devoted to ATM work. And so you'll find a lot of information there um, where you'll get ideas. You'll also find a lot of people that are happy to share, which is both a plus and a minus um, because, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen, you know, spill the soup <laughs> or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and so if you find something that you, you know, if after looking at cloudy nights, you find, you know, a project that you're interested in wanting to tackle, then the best advice that I could give is find a mentor, a single mentor, you know, because there will be lots of people that are willing to chime in some who know what they're talking about, some who know less about what they're talking about. And, and often there are many ways to solve the problem. And so it's best to just kind of stick with, with one person as, as a mentor. Um, on YouTube, um, Gordon Waits is a guy that uh, I've, um, I've seen a bunch of stuff from, and he's also a, a really high-end optician. Um, yeah, so that might... Wait, Research, w, I think is... Yeah, yeah, W-A-I-T-E-S. Yeah. Um, so he's got a, a bunch of videos on grinding. Um, so, you know, a lot, uh, geez, there's so many po uh, things to talk about related to this. Um, you know, when you're grinding your mirror and you're polishing and whatnot, um, you can do it by hand. Um, but a lot of people use um, machines. And so, um, and, and especially as you get to bigger and bigger apertures, it becomes very um, tiring to grind and polish. And so as a result, um, you can um, create machines that basically do the grunt work for you. Um, and, and, you know, they'll, and, and typically the, the machine spins the glass and then spins the tool that's on top of the glass to, to basically, you know, do that, that back and forth thing that I was talking about at the outset, you know, where, you know, you, you rub two pieces of glass together with grid in between and one becomes convex and one becomes concave. You can replace that rubbing by spinning 
and you can replace your hands by a machine that basically, you know, through pulleys and whatnot is moving, moving the, um, the tool back and forth across the surface of the mirror. And that's a way to get a very, very regular and, uh, and very nice surface. Um, but, you know, if you're making like a small mirror, like let's say 10 inches or less, it's way more um, effective to just do it by hand. But if you're wanting to tackle a 24 inch mirror, let's say, or something even bigger than that, a machine is definitely the way to go because it's just very, very laborious and, and time consuming and tiring. Um, so, yeah, so Gordon Waits, um, you know, has is is uses machines. So if you're interested in machines, that's um, um, that's a great resource. Um, yeah, that's, um, you know, it, it, and then, and then you'll find an ATM community. Um, it's, it's probably unlikely that you'll find a local ATM community because it's a relatively, um, niche thing now, because, you know, as we said, you know, for modest apertures, you know, it's probably more effective to, uh, to just buy something and start using it unless you're a maker, you know, and, and then, and then you'll kind of associate yourself with makers kind of across the globe. And if you have special, um, special interests or special desires, um, you know, like you want, let's say you want, you want an eight inch telescope, but you want to make it a travel scope. You want to make it something that can, um, fit underneath the, uh, an airplane seat. You know, uh, there are people that have done that sort of thing and you can search for it. And that there's this one guy on, uh, and he posts occasionally cloudy, cloudy nights, um, He's in Europe, Raoul something. I can't remember his, his name now, but he makes these beautiful, beautiful travel scopes that are ultra minimal, you know, very, very little to them. But, you know, the engineering is just amazing because it all kind of collapses down and fits into a box that can then, you know, slide under the seat in front of you on an airplane. You know, mm -hmm. so that, that kind of thing is, is, is really, really cool and inspiring. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Well, we're, I think we're just about getting uh, to about time. We don't want to cut anybody off here, Tom, but do you have any other um, advice or any other uh, information about your telescope uh, before we uh, conclude? Um, well, as I said, you know, my, my website's got some info on it. Um, I also did a couple of presentations to the, um, to the Toronto Center for Royal Astronomical oh, yeah. Society, and those videos are up on YouTube. So if you search YouTube for Rask and Artemis, then you'll probably find them. There, there are two videos there. And that'll that'll kind of talk about my journey a little bit more with some more pictures and whatnot. And uh, yeah, and I'll share some pictures with you guys so that you can put them in the show notes. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Shane, do you have anything uh, you'd like to add before we conclude? No, this was a fascinating conversation. Um, this is a, a topic that I've been very interested in, but I really haven't dug too deep. And being able to have this conversation was super enjoyable. Uh, you know, if there's ever a part two to this, I would love to continue the conversation. And um, part part of the ATMing that I'm maybe a little more, well, I shouldn't say more interested in, but I've considered... Uh, uh, buying some refractor lenses and then yeah. putting it all together and, but, uh, have some concerns or questions around that too. Um, uh, yeah. so yeah, well, there's, there's lots to talk about on this yeah. topic. 3d printing is a huge enabler and, mm. um, it, you know, so you can engineer really precise parts that way. And, um, uh, you know, I don't have a refractor, um, but I am considering building a, a, um, a pair of astronomical binoculars because one of the group mm. of people that I kind of regularly correspond with is doing large aperture um, kits for um, binoculars. So they're all 3D mm. printed and then you just get lenses off of AliExpress or wherever, mm -hmm. you know, and you can make like, um, so that I've got on my shelf um, a couple of 80 millimeter lenses that I got um, from Surplus Shed actually in the States. Okay. And, uh, and he's got plans for, um, uh, an 80 millimeter one and, uh, and a 120. Wow. So, uh, yeah. So that's, that's, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. That's, yeah. I don't have any other experience <laughs> on that yet. <laughs> well, look, thanks so much, Tom, for joining us today. This was, uh, this was really great. Um, I, like, I, like, while some people are like am armchair astronomers, I'm like an armchair ATM where I don't do any of it. But I, I read the ATM forums. I don't participate at all. I just love seeing what people build and have been really fortunate 
um, to look through uh, telescopes that people have made. And like I was sharing with you, some of my best views have been through uh, through those sort of telescopes. Yeah. So thank you for sharing uh, your process today. And it was uh, my pleasure. We hope we hope that you'll consider coming back at a future point in time and and maybe having some further discussions on this topic. Sure, I'd, I'd love to. That would be great. Love to. And you guys are doing a great job. I, I'm really stoked. To, you know, I, I've said I'm I'm getting out of ATM mode at the moment and into observing mode. And so, you know, the the discussions that you guys have are really inspirational. So, it's uh, really helping me on my observational part of astronomy. Well, thanks. We appreciate that. And thanks to you, Shane. Thanks for uh, for chiming in with your questions. And for everybody uh, who's listening, thank you for listening. Um, you can subscribe in your pod catching software and uh, hopefully catch some more of these, uh, these ATM topics as we hopefully go through them in the future. And you can always uh, send us your observations, or maybe there's more amateur telescope makers out there than we realize. So you can always contact us at actualastronomy at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you everyone for listening. And we hope you enjoyed the show. If you are interested in more information, would like to contact us, or if you would like to support the podcast, check out our website, actualastronomy.com.